one of the targets, one of the goals was to make transportation <clears throat> more than four or 18 wheels, a more well, integrated approach to transportation. Yeah. And? Well, 2020 tried to do that. Um, <clears throat> the whole issue about physical discipline um, really had an impact on us because we, first thing we did was we took that wish list, those wish lists from all of the participants, added them all up, and between 95 and 2020, we would need to spend $5 billion. And we calculated we only had $1.9 billion. A bit of a shortfall. A bit of a shortfall. So how do you reconcile that difference? One of the things that we had noticed is that we were kind of caught in a, in a do loop in terms of freeways. Now, I mentioned Robert Moses before, and like a lot of cities in the country, we had a Robert Moses freeway plan. We were gonna build a freeway along the riverfront on both sides. We were gonna build a Midtown Expressway. We were gonna build, you know, the North Belt and the South Loop were all uh, freeways. So we had our, we had our Moses plan. Um, what we started noticing, and it was evident, most evident to me in Saline County along the I-30 corridor, is that uh, Saline County at the time was sending a huge percent of their workforce. The, the aluminum plants had closed down. Most of their workforce was driving into Pulaski County every day. And it was driving in on I-30 because there were no other arterial connections. How else? And so, the, the, if you're a highway builder, the solution is to widen I-30. Well, if you widen I-30, you don't have any money left to build any ulterior, uh, alternative arterial uh, ways to keep people from getting on I-30. So all the traffic goes to I-30. Now it's crowded again, so the answer is to widen it again. And when you spend all your money widening it again, there's no money left for building alternative methods. So you're just, you, you're stuck, you're caught in that freeway widening loop. We didn't have the money for that. We were $3 billion short. So we uh, came upon, for, were first forced upon really a strategy to develop a balanced transportation system. So the first thing we did was we called for uh, going on and widening all the freeways in the metropolitan area to six through lanes. Uh, we were getting a lot of NAFTA traffic. Uh, uh, truck traffic was projected to increase significantly. Rail traffic had gone up. And one of the things identified in the public outreach was especially in, in small towns around the metropolitan area, but in our cities too, was the fact that with the increase in train traffic, you had a you, you might have a stop hundred unit coal train between the fire station and the public school or the hospital and mm -hmm. the nursing home. Uh, so we needed to build rail road separations uh, in the metropolitan area. So for freight movement, for safety, uh, let's go on and and plan for a multi-million dollar freeway expansion program to six lanes everywhere. But when we get to six lanes, let's pause and then take that money and build our regional arterials that can provide high capacity means for intra-regional traffic that weren't being forced onto the freeways to get around the region, that weren't competing with 18 wheelers on the freeways just to go, you know, from here to the, to the Walmart or, or the grocery store. So, and then once we've done that, let's invest in some regional scale public transit. And then when we have that balanced transportation system, then we can start reinvesting in freeways again. 
So we had that, that led directly to what has become known as the six lane cap on freeways. It was really let's build the six lanes and then let's take our limited resources and build a balanced transportation system before we go back to freeways. The other thing that 2020 did, partly uh, because the state refused to pay for it uh, and therefore the cities refused to pay for it, was the long planned Midtown Freeway, which would have come uh, down Pike Avenue. There's a reason Pike Avenue has a 300 foot right of way there for a five lane road. It's because it was going to be a freeway, would have crossed over, uh, intersected with 630 at the viaduct, which was designed to receive it, and then gone on down and intersected with 30 at Scott Hamilton Drive. And uh, so the state said, well, well, that's good, guys, but we're not paying for it. And there uh, got to be some development interest um, in the old uh, rate uh, wood products company uh, property, which is on Cantrell Road, which is now the Stevens Episcopal School campus. Uh, and then Dillard's eventually built the stadium center in the right of way. And, and so <clears throat> there wasn't no money for it. There was no room for it anymore. And although we still desperately need another bridge across the river downtown, uh, we dropped the Midtown from the, from the plan in 2020. The other thing that the TAC recommended to the board in their initial plan development, this is the recommendation not taken, uh, that was very controversial at the time. They kept the North Belt Freeway on the plan and said build the first leg of the freeway, then acquire the right-of-way. Now, acquire the right-of-way through Sherwood uh, and then North Little Rock and then don't build the freeway until 2020. Well, you would have thought that we had done all kinds of unspeakable things with that recommendation. And then there was great debate over it, which is, you know, what is supposed to happen yeah, in a free and open society. Yeah. <clears throat> um, it, if that had recommendation had been taken, the right of way would have been in place instead of residential subdivisions. And that roadway could have been built in segments as we could afford it. Uh, but what happened was uh, the cost got to be so large uh, that it simply had to be taken off the plan of acquisition. Yeah. So that was the recommendation not taken on the North Belt Freeway. Literally the road not, literally, not taken. Literally the road not taken. So. The, the other thing that this physical constraint led us to do is I can't remember how many miles of federal aid eligible roadway we've got in the region. Way more than we can fund with that little bit of money we have. So it led us to the development later as a follow up to 2020, uh, the development of a defined regional arterial network. 2020 defined several key arterials that needed to be improved. And we made a lot of progress since then in actually doing those identified projects. And then we said the, the whole purpose was to narrow the funding funnel from everything that's potentially eligible to less focus on the most important things. So the funds, federal funds that were coming through Metroplan focused on the regional arterial network, focused on regional bikeway connectors, and at the time that was the, the uh, Arkansas River Trail. Uh, the Southwest Trail has been added to that. Uh, and focus on transit investments that have the uh, potential to change land use. So one of the things that we invested in was ultimately was uh, the first phase of river rail. And if you track the amount of urban development I've done carry a lot of people from a transportation standpoint, but from an urban redevelopment standpoint, it is an incredible success. Look at the millions of dollars of public and private investment 
that have occurred since that, e even since it was announced along the that little trolley line route and think of what the expansion of that could do in terms of urban redevelopment. So that's that's the, the other two things that happened uh, in Metro 2020 that then have led uh, to a lot of other things uh, since then. The, on the river rail, Jim, can you point to that and say, conversely, <clears throat> this might have happened anyway without river rail? Uh, well, well, given the given Clinton Center down there. And yeah, uh, it hadn't happened. And it hadn't happened in other metropolitan areas that we studied across the country until the transit investment was made. And it's, it's not just running buses because bus routes can change. You're, in, you're investing in a 30-year mortgage here to build this building. You want to know that something there is going to be permanent. So you want overhead cantonary. You want rail. I think you can do it with just the overhead cantonary and put the trolleys on rubber tiles, tires. But that's that's just me. And, and that's some uh, Europeans have done some experiments along those lines. But if you look around the country at these trolley investments or the light rail investments in Portland, wasn't happening before. It happened afterwards in city after city. So I couldn't say definitively that it wouldn't happen. I'm just saying it hadn't happened and then it did. I think one of the questions that folks want to know is, okay, you did you did the plan. Now did you do anything? Did you implement the plan? And if not, why not? And I think there are probably, <clears throat> from my standpoint, uh, you always want to do everything you say you're going to do. To to you know to dream the impossible dream and achieve it. And Metro 2020 dreamed big, didn't get all the way there. Um, and part of the reason is a, a decision. It was a political decision that we made early on that the new standards that we had developed, the new design requirements that we had developed in 2020 wouldn't apply to projects that were already in the pipeline. Too late to change them. Uh, too difficult from a political standpoint to go back and rework them. Turns out that was an awful long pipeline. And we really didn't get our first demonstration project on the ground till really after about a decade after we adopted the plan. Oh. That was Dave Ward Drive in Conway. So it was a state highway it's a two-lane roadway that they wanted to widen it to five lanes. And we worked with the newly elected mayor of Townsville in Conway to develop a median controlled access manage with a formal access management plan. Sidewalks back from the curb with buffer zones. Uh, and working with individual property owners on the access, cross access uh, plan that required the approval of the city of Conway Metro Plan and the Highway Department before it could be changed. So it was going to be there for a while. I, that's, a, to me, it was a wonderful success. Once people saw that, then they started asking for it. Then we did Military Road in Benton, same way. Alcoa Road with several roundabouts in it. Now roundabouts have been introduced because of the success of the roundabouts at, on Hark Rider and Conway, there by Hendricks College. And of course, under Tab Downs' leadership as mayor, Conway is now Roundabout City and they have more roundabouts per capita maybe than any place in the country. And they work well. They're safer, they move traffic, they reduce congestion, uh, reduce air pollution. So all those are wonderful reforms. In terms of some of the things that I think, the other, I think the other reason uh, that we didn't get enough stuff on the ground as quickly as we hoped was because, you know, historically this metropolitan area grows at one percent a year. In the seventies, we we were just blowing it out the wazoo, and we were growing at two percent a year. Uh, 
Now, if you go up, if we had had the same growth rate that Northwest Arkansas has had over the last several decades, or Austin or Dallas or any of them, mm -hmm. <clears throat> you've got more private development, you have more opportunities to put more things on the ground, you have more examples for people to see and use quicker, and it becomes ingrained quicker in the way that you do things. Um, and we didn't have that. We had a pretty slow growth rate. The 80s were tough, started coming out of it in the 90s. And of course, in the Great Re Recession set things back in the first decade of the 2000s. <clears throat> but there are some things that we did accomplish. And before Metro 2020, um, engine, uh, traffic engineers didn't like sidewalks. They just didn't like them. Pedestrians got in the way of cars. And if they had to put them in, they put them in up against the curb because it was cheaper to do it that way. Yeah. Well, if you're a pedestrian and then cars are going by 40 or 50 miles an hour, that feels dangerous. Not terribly inviting. Not terribly inviting. So one of the things that the standards in 2020 did was to say, if you're gonna use federal funds in the urban area, you're gonna build sidewalks. And unless it's physically impossible, you're gonna separate those from the curb by four or five feet, ideally. And it, that was a difficult sell. Um, but gradually people came to recognize it was the right thing to do. RDOT eventually adopted it as a standard statewide. So they're going to do it here. They were going to get asked to do it in other places. Let's just make it a statewide standard. Now sidewalks are second nature. Pedestrians have to be included as part of the process. Bikeways. I remember riding bikes and the, and the bikeway consisted of the four inch white line down the side of the road, right? So you had to stay on that because you had, you were in travel or in the travel lane otherwise. And now we've got, we've got bike plans, uh, bike, bike friendly communities all over the region. Uh, we help fund uh, uh, through Judge Valine's leadership it's actually Pat Hayes' idea, he'll tell you that if you ask him. The Big Damn Bridge. Well, they're friends. So. Uh, they're friends, and they work together on it. They did a great job. We helped fund that. Uh, one of the wonders of the world built uh, trails to it, and now um, cycling is, uh, is a big thing here, and that's, that's good. We heard the community say, we're trapped by these trains. Our communities are cut in half. So we identified a dozen rail grade separations around the region, strategically spaced, and worked with the state, several of them are on state highways, worked with the state to fund all of them. Um, I just read it in the paper this morning, Gar Springs Road is being closed so that they can build the rail grade separation over Gar Springs. Uh, and then I think then we're down to one in Jacksonville and uh, and one up in Mayflower, and that one's under design. So, you know, that's, a, that's something we heard. It took 20 years of consistent effort. Kudos to the elected officials uh, who, who kept at it, but it's a promise kept, and I th I'm real proud of that. The whole issue of access management was wasn't in Arkansas. <laughs> it was in one driveway here, I have a driveway. Uh, but now, uh, really, the, the kind of access management agreements that Metroplan helped pioneer are kind of the gold standard uh, for the state. Roundabouts, while they weren't in 2020, uh, the development shortly after that led to us proposing roundabouts in several places. And that's um, a major achievement. One of the things that we had hoped for and that we had visualized in 2020 was tie in land use development much closer to transportation so that we weren't doing the strip commercial roadways that everybody hated in the initial preference survey. 
they were doing mixed use developments so that we could have residential over retail and village centers. Mm -hmm. We were, could do cluster development and keep, <clears throat> keep rural areas rural. That's been uh, harder to come by. Uh, there have been spotty examples, Hendricks Village in Conway, excellent example of a new urbanist uh, mixed use uh, compact uh, development. Um, the, everything that's happened down at the River Market, of course, uh, is an example of that. Downtown North Little Rock is doing some wonderful stuff in that mode, but we're just not doing uh, enough of it yet. And so, uh, in my opinion, inertia is the strong force of the universe, uh, and it takes a while to, once you turn the wheel of the ocean liner for the nose of the ship to start turning. Um, but I think we'll get there. Will I ever get used to roundabouts? Yeah. I love them. You know, it's just, you, you pull up at an intersection and you, you know, if you're going to turn right, you get in the right lane. If you're going to go straight, you get in the middle lane. If you're going to turn left, you get in the left lane. And roundabouts work the same way. I'm just old, I suppose. I'm so <laughs> anyway, you talked about gravity or inertia as a powerful force. Yeah. In any kind of human activity. It's easier to do nothing than something, obviously. How do you find it? Um, <clears throat> I was born in Yale County 70 years ago, so I, Arkansas goes way back. I, I've learn that things move slow in Arkansas sometimes. And the way you fight it is perseverance. <clears throat> There's one other thing that I want to mention uh, about Metro 2020 and its implementation successes. Uh, and in my 28 years as executive director here, I was incredibly lucky to have a, a group of extraordinary elected officials. Um, first, uh, Pat Hayes, Jim Daly, and Buddy the Lions, but there are a dozen others that you could name. Uh, Tab Townsend was one of them, Mayor Conway, for 20 years, served on our technical committees before that, who were in office for a long time, who were committed to working together to solve problems of, of the region and to seeing some of these things through. And I think without that, consistency without that perseverance to implement this plan, we wouldn't have got as much of it done as we did. Well, at lunch the other day, uh, the former mayors, the former county judge, this uh, the mayor Hayes in particular mentioned the enormous advantage that comes to any kind of metropolitan <clears throat> planning effort and that's political stability. Mm -hmm. Uh, not just in the chief executive's chair, but on the governing boards as well. City board, city council, quorum court. Which means that they keep getting reelected, or are there long enough where they get to know one another and they trust one another, or at a minimum they know where they're coming from? Each other is... Um, I think that's one of the, one of the things that uh, the Metro Plan Board is useful for it, brings chief executives together from around the region. One of the things that we started doing, and, and uh, I think TAB is still doing, is, is uh, benchmarking other cities and, and taking these folks out and meeting other cities. Now, at the, at the council level, I don't think enough of that interaction is going on um, or had gone on, and hopefully more of it can go on. Um, so, you know, it's, <clears throat> I, it's hard, I think, to, let me get back on the Wayback Machine and start going back to 1903 in the Hoxie Walnut Ridge Bill that allowed the city of North Little Rock to annex the 8th Ward of Little Rock on the north side of the river. And the fact that the mayor of Little Rock was so angry, he 
he told everybody in Little Rock to dump their stray dogs on the north side. Uh, and there, there wasn't that kind of cooperation that we saw with the advent of those three really extraordinary gentlemen I named earlier, uh, Jim Daly in Little Rock, Buddy the Lions as county judge and Pat Hayes, who determined that it was in the best interest of their community to all work together. And the other mayors of the county who joined them in the River Project and those kind of common efforts that really is an extraordinary moment in the history of this region and we shouldn't forget it and we shouldn't take it for granted because you have to work at that kind of stuff well it's nice to look back on metro 2020 it really was a, a product of its time we had uh, some reformers in the congress uh, some good uh, leadership at the national level and at the state level and at the regional level uh, we enacted a lot of ideas, but but the I think that national leadership isn't there, uh, and the, and we have I think we as a society are faced with an existential uh, threat slash opportunity, and that's climate change. I think all of the institutions of our, our society. Uh, from the way we generate power to the way we build our cities and the way we get around uh, are going to have to change and change quicker than we've been used to changing in the past uh, to address that that problem. Um, and that's going to change everything. So if we did 2020 again, I think, and, and we went out and asked the public what we need to address, you'll find a whole lot of folks, and especially young folks, who say you, you, we need to look at this through the lens of climate change and and plan our communities that way. And so the challenge that, that I would offer uh, to have in Metro Plan and the leaders of the organization today is it may be time to go back and do another significant public outreach, reframe the dialogue based on what we see coming in the next 20 or 25 years tall order in this cultural political climate of ours. Yep, it is, but the communities that do it are the communities that are gonna come out on top in the future. 2020, we talked about the promise of 2020. Has it been fulfilled or the promise, the challenge of 2020? Mm -hmm. Have we risen to the challenge and has the promise, to what extent has the promise been fulfilled? Uh, it's, it's been partially fulfilled. Uh, we made progress towards uh, the vision that was outlined in 2020. We're still short on the land use side. I think failure at the federal level removes that imperative from above. I think if we're gonna succeed uh, as a region, we're gonna have to have a, a dedicated funding source at the regional level. Uh, there's legislation to form, to allow the formation of regional mobility authorities. There could be multi-county cooperatives that could tax themselves. Unfortunately, there's not a viable tax source associated uh, with that legislation. So I think that would be important. There are some regional roadways that need to be built that aren't gonna be built. South Loop is one of those, completing Conway Loop perhaps. Uh, so, and, a, and another bridge across the Arkansas River downtown, I still think that's absolutely necessary. So there's, there's a lot of opportunity that we're not gonna uh, be able to realize unless at the local and regional level we control those funds. Uh, asking for money from Papa or Mama uh, at the federal and state government's not gonna uh, do it. There's an old uh, Billy Holiday song, God Bless the Child Who's Got the Wrong. <laughs> you remember that one. And uh, and I think that's, uh, you know, if we're ever going to fulfill that vision. The other imperative, honestly, the, the sprawl development pattern that we've seen simply is not physically sustainable for our cities. Uh, and so we're going to be forced from a financial standpoint to rethink some of that. 
and uh, and the the climate change imperative that I mentioned really is going to fundamentally change everything about society and our institutions, and we need to start getting ready for that because it's going to come on us a lot quicker than we think. See you later, Thank you, Steve.